Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers. Working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSIT, working for communities across New York State. Hey now, let's take a moment. So we all can figure it out. What it's all about. It's the Homework Welcome to Homework Hotline, I'm Craig Zaramba. And I'm Donna Minio. Homework Hotline is the place where you can get the tools you need to succeed both in and out of the classroom. For more information on Homework Hotline, go to our website, homeworkhotline.org. Here you can find games, other online resources, and the latest episode of our show. And don't forget, we want to hear from you on this topic. What would your personal mascot or symbol be, and why? Would it reflect who you are? Would you include interests, talents, or skills? You can weigh in on this question and tell us what you think by visiting us on Facebook and leaving us a message, tweeting us by using the hashtag HHVoiceIt, or by visiting our website, homerkotline.org, and clicking on the Voice It button. Now remember, the most thought-provoking responses will be put on air. The answers will be shared on tomorrow's Homework Hotline. Cool. I like reading those. Uh, it's fun. All right. It is Tuesday, and that means it's time for our Creature Teaser. This animal lives in Japan. It is usually found in the forests and mountains. It has a stocky body and long arms and legs and is covered in thick grayish brown fur that keeps it warm during the cold winters. This creature is known for its human-like facial expressions which are easy to see on its naked red face. It has opposable thumbs and can walk on its hind legs when necessary. This primate scavenges for food. It eats fruits, berries, nuts, insects, and bird eggs and stuffs food in its large cheek pouches while gathering. It is a social animal and loves spending time in a group grooming and eating together. This animal often has to endure harsh winters and is known for sitting in hot springs heated by volcanoes to keep warm. Now, if you think you can solve the creature teaser, give our hotline a call at 1-866-264-5904, or just answer it on our website, homeworkhotline.org. Answer correctly, and you could have a chance to share the answer at the end of the show. Every correct response will be added to our hotline hall of fame. Earn enough points, and you could win a tablet at the end of the season. All right, March is a very exciting month. Not only is it Women's History Month, but it is also March Madness. This week on Homework Hotline, we will be, co we will be combining our celebration of Women's History Month and March Madness by taking a different look at the Women's NCAA Basketball Tournament. Today, we'll compare teams by looking at data. All right, I created a lesson cool. um, that will lead into yours all talking right. all about the different types of basketball shots. Sounds good. So come along. All right, first thing, there, I used to watch basketball when I was in high school. I haven't wa really watched it since, which, tell you the truth, it's been a long time. So I had to re refresh a lot of these different shots for myself. And it's what is a free throw or a foul shot? That's what I knew it as. So where does a player make a fr um, free throw from? Well, if you look at a basketball court, you actually have this area here, this is rectangle, and then there's this line right here. And there's a half circle behind it. This is your free throw line. That's where you usually will end up throwing if you get a foul, um, sometimes technicals, things like that will allow you to give a free shot, an actual shot at the basket without anyone trying to stop you. So what are the percent of free throws made in the regular season? Well, if you watched yesterday, I was talking about Louisville and Mississippi State. So I thought I'd continue. And Louisville actually makes 75.2% of their free throw shots. So for out of 100 points, they make roughly 75 of those for a free, um, free throw. 
Mississippi actually is 73.8. So it's a, just a little bit less than Louisville, but they're pretty close. If I rounded that, it's about a 74 out of 100. So now if we take a look at your three-point shots, the, in the NCAA, the three-point line or the semicircle that you see right here, this line all the way around is actually 20 feet, nine inches from the goal. And what they mean by goal is the basket that right here. So all of this, all the way around, your radius is 20 feet, nine inches. Now, the percent of free throws or three point shots made in the regular season, Louisville only makes 38% of those. And Mississippi only is making 39.2, so roughly 39%. So Louisville was better in the foul shots, but Mississippi's better in the three pointers. Now, field goals are any two point shot made anywhere on the, on the court. So it, uh, and other than if you're standing here for a technical or anything like that. So field goals made in the regular season. Louisville has 48% of those and Mississippi 47. Again, they're pretty even there. Both these teams are doing pretty good now and it explains why they're both ranked number one. So now let's take a look. Um, this was um, the Louisville Cardinals versus the Boise State. This was round one, the first game. And they actually, the Boise State made 11 points in the first quarter. Well, how could we get those? Remember, we have one point, we have two points, and we have three points. So now what you could do in order to figure this out is you can actually just create a table. So what you would do is you... And if you remember a couple weeks ago, Laura did um, a, a problem where she created the table. And this was your one point, your two point, your three point, and then your total. So let's say we're gonna get 11. And I know because it's not an even number, I have to have more than just my two pointers. So I can do a one point. That gets rid of that and leaves me 10 shots left. Well, 10 shots, well, five times two is 10. So that would give me my 11 points as well. You could also do three three-pointers because three three-pointers are nine points and then a two-point which would give you 11 points. So those are different ways to be able to get an 11 point um, quarter or whatever. But now look at the quarter three for the um, Louisville Cardinals. They got a 27. Now that's kind of different because I've got to think, okay, 27, oh, it's a multiple of three. So I could have gotten nine three pointers to get a 27. I could have also, done, uh, let's see, we could have taken 10 two-pointers, which is 20, and if I do two three-pointers, that's six more, and then a one-pointer, that gives me 27. So there's a lot of different ways to be able to get these using one, two, and three. We can also take a look at 13 and 21. Same idea, same idea. So let's take a look. Well, looking at the other team I was looking at, which is Nichols State and Mississippi State, totals your three-pointers, your two-pointers, and your one-pointer. Again, think about the points. 13 points, it's not even. So I can get a one-pointer in here because that gets me down to an even. So now I have 12 left. Well, I could do six two-pointers. That gives me my 12. I could have also done a one-pointer and four three-pointers to get my 12. Because remember, whatever you're doing, whatever these numbers are in your columns, you're multiplying it by the top to get how many points it's worth. Now, 21, again, it's the same idea as 27, or you can take an, oh, wait, three times seven. So I could do seven three-pointers. That would give me 21. Or if you think about it, you, it's an odd number again, so I could have done a one-pointer, and I could have, oh, I need 20 more, so I need 10 two-pointers. So there's this whole different array of ways to make these different points. But take a look, Mississippi beat by 95 to 50, 
So there's a lot of different ways, just looking at the different quarters on how they got that. So I'm really hoping that this helps you understand what the different points on the basketball court does and where they're actually shot from. I hope you enjoy. Here's a fun saying to help you remember the basic needs of the human body. Oh, can Venus flies make pretty webs? This actually helps you remember oxygen, carbohydrates, vitamins, fats, minerals, protein, water. Do you know why flamingos are pink? I do. Today we head to the Rosamond Gifford Zoo in Syracuse, New York to learn about flamingos. Check it out. The Chilean flamingos get their pink color from the food they eat. They actually, there's pigments in the brine shrimp that they eat and the brine flies. Here at the zoo, what we have to do, they get a dry kind of uh, mix. It's almost like cat food or dog food, but small. And there's actually that pigment coloration in that food uh, to keep them nice and pink so they, they're not just white. Ours are the Chilean flamingos, but there's also lesser flamingos, greater flamingos, Puna flamingos, so there's a little bit of diversity there. What makes the Chilean flamingos different from other flamingos is basically the color. Most of them are typically pinkish in color, but the, the bill size is smaller, the coloration on the bill, the coloration on some of the wings. These guys are taller than some of the other ones. Now the greater flamingo is actually taller than the ones we have, but there's also uh, smaller ones that, that are out there. These guys are located in South America, Peru, Brazil. And they can be found in the coastal mudflats, uh, estuaries, uh, lagoons, uh, salt lakes. The Chilean flamingos are related to other birds. There's kind of a little battle going on right now because they're related somewhat to storks and like herrings, but also to wild fowl because of the ha they actually have partially webbed feet, so it's kind of split. And most scientists are kind of split uh, on where to place them, uh, and they kind of want to place them in their own category in the middle of that. Our Chilean flamingos do fly, just like uh, other flamingos uh, in the wild. They're, they're not the most graceful flyers, but uh, they do fly. Once they're up there, they fly, they're pretty strong flyers once they get up, up in the air. They can fly for, for miles and miles. They can go uh, pretty good distances, especially if they're looking for water. The Chilean flamingos will pre protect themselves primarily with their, their beaks, but they also uh, can use their, their head to knock. Um, when we have to do procedures with these guys, um, we have to catch them up, and they'll actually knock their, their head. Uh, you know, it's very long neck, so they can reach around, uh, but they'll knock their head uh, uh, against us, but they'll also bite us. Uh, and you, you wouldn't think with that beak they could do much damage, but they like to uh, bite and, and twist and kind of pinch. Chilean flamingos' um, bill, uh, bills at birth are straight, and the reason they're straight is so that the parents can actually feed them by regurgitation, uh, and about a couple months after they're born, that their beaks will actually um, start to curve. Um, kind of a unique thing with these guys, uh, when they regurgitate, it's kind of like a reverse regurgitation, because their bill is kind of curved, um, they'll actually regurgitate, and that regurgitation will kind of drip off the end of the bill, so that the baby chick can actually almost like nurse off the top of the bill. They do um, occasionally sit down. They don't do that a whole lot. And if you can see in the background those long legs and the way they bend, it's very difficult for them to get up from a sitting position. So they don't often do that. The females will, will sit when they're on the nest, but most of the time these guys will actually stand. And when they do, they'll do the old uh, one leg and stand, you know, um, and kind of rest in that position at night and tuck their head and their feathers underneath their, their wings when they sleep. A lot of people think that that's actually their knee, and they think that because it's so high up. And the reason they have that um, ankle so high up is the, the way they feed is they feed on the bottom of, of lakes or streams or, or mud flats and their heads upside down when they're feeding and they kind of sift uh, through that mud to get those insects and bugs. So by having that uh, ankle way up there it allows them to be able to go in deeper water but keep their body out of the water and get their head and their long neck down and be able to reach the bottom. But it also allows them to do that in shallow water. So their adaptation for survival is to have those ankles way up high so they can bend like that, but keep their body out of the water so they're not getting their feathers wet all the time. All right, I think flamingos are pretty cool, yeah. and I'm actually kind of glad they're not the color of those plastic things that we have in our yard. Well, I just find it interesting that uh, the babies are born with a straight beak that kind of curves later on in life. It's kind of 
the expression of those mm -hmm. genes gets uh, applied later on. It's kind of cool. And brine shrimp, they're really, really tiny, tiny shrimps, right? Tiny, tiny, yeah, things, tiny, yeah. tiny, tiny, tiny yep. things. Now, if you would like to see this video again or others like it, visit our website, homeworkhotline.org. Cool. All right, so I'm going to build on what you were doing with okay. uh, the scoring, the percentages, free throw, stuff like that. So come Sounds on. Sounds great. All right. So we're talking March Madness, and we're talking the NCAA, uh, NCAA Division I Women's Basketball Tournament. So I pulled down a bracket, and um, I picked a couple teams. In the bracket, I couldn't get the side, but uh, we're over. There's four divisions. There's Lexington, Kansas City, Albany, and um, uh, I can't remember another one on this side over here. So I picked, I picked... Dayton, Ohio. Um, my wife went there and uh, just happened to be for her first year of college, and they played Marquette. And you can see that Dayton kind of lost, and you can see over here on the map where Dayton is and where Rochester is over there. So uh, about a day drive, eight, nine hours or so. And what I found out was that um, during the season or during the game, it shows percentage-wise. And then the, the graphic that I got here shows how many points Dayton scored per the NCAA average, all right? And you can see how many points they scored per game, 73.3, the rebounds, assist. And we're going to target in on field goals, which are uh, two-pointers, and then the three-pointers, what they are. So they had 42.7% field goals. The average was 44.1, a little lower. And their uh, three-point uh, percentage was 38.4, which is actually higher than the NCAA um, percentages. So now when I, what I actually did is I went in and took a look at their schedule for the season and counted up how many points they scored for the whole year. All right, And they played, uh, I think it was, if we go back one slide here, it says they played uh, 27 wins and 7 losses. So they played 30 games. All right, And in those 30 games, they scored 22,164 uh, points. All right, that's Pretty good, I guess. I don't know. Um, we know that they scored 38.4% with three-pointers and 42.7% were two-pointers. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to set these up as fractions, all right? And I'm going to take my percentage because I know 38.4 is a percent, which is over 100, all right? And I don't know how many of those are three-pointers that they scored, but I do know how many they scored in the whole season, which is 2,064. So here's where we're going to do a little bit of math. So to do this, I'm going to do a little cross-multiplying. So 100 times x gives me 100x. And then I go 38.4 times 2164. So we come over here and we use our calculator. I go 38.4 times 2164 equals, and that gives me equals 83097.6. All right, so now, what does that mean? Well, we're not done yet. So we're gonna find out what X is. Now to get X, X is held to the 100 by multiplication. So I have to do just the opposite. Now remember, whatever I do on one side, I have to do on the other side of the equation. Now 100 divided by 100 gives me one, and that just gives me an X, and X equals. Now the cool thing when you're dividing by any number with 100, 10, 1,000, a million, or whatever, I know my decimal is at the very end of my 100. So by dividing by 100, I'm actually going to move my decimal one, two places right here. Now I have to remind my students all the time on doing this, I can't write this number as 830.97.6 because then I don't know what decimal I'm actually counting. So what I, I tell my students is you got to make sure this is a good uh, a good uh, strategy to do, but you got to make sure you move the actual decimal. So 830 decimal, and I'm going to round that to, let's say, 98. And again, you can't score a percentage of a point in basketball. So that's going to actually round up to 831 of those were actually made as three-pointers. All right? So now we're going to look at uh, what percentage did they make as Two-pointers, and I, let's go back and check, make sure that's where actually there were two-pointers. So these are anywhere out in the court other than on the line or a three-point shot. So we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to do our cross-multiplying. We have 100x equals, and I come over and I use my calculator, clear this out, 42 or clear, 42.7 times 2164 equals. That gives me... 9,000 or 9,2402.8, all right? And again, I'm going to divide by 100. I'm going to divide by 100, 
All right? And when, again, when we're dividing, this becomes x. And when I do this, I'm going to change color so you can see I'm moving my decimal because I'm dividing by 100. becomes 924.02. And that would actually round to a 3, but again, you can't have a percentage of a score in basketball, so they scored 924 points. So now, let's see if this totals up to our total number right there. And if it doesn't, then we can figure out how many they actually scored as free throws without having to do a percentage of that, all right? So let's take our numbers together and find this out. We're gonna go 831, and I'm gonna add 924. One, uh, and we're gonna add four plus one is five. Three plus two gives me five, and nine plus uh, eight gives me 17. So between three pointers and uh, shots uh, out in the field, they scored 1,755, but all year they scored 2,164. So let's figure out how many they actually made from on the line, all right? So we're gonna do the same thing. Now we're gonna do math here again. We're gonna go 2,164, and I'm gonna extend my page here a little bit, and I'm gonna subtract minus 1,755. How many were free throws and actually uh, two-point shots? Now I know I cannot subtract four from five, so that becomes a 14. The six becomes a five. 14 minus five gives me a nine. 5 minus 5 is a 0. 1, again, I can't take 7 from 1, so I get a borrow. That becomes an 11. This becomes 1. 11 take away 7 gives me 4. And 1 minus 1 is a 0. So now we know they scored 409 free throws. They scored 924 two-pointers. And they scored, uh, what was my other number here? 831 three-pointers. All right, which is pretty cool. Now, we can do the same thing with their, their, their opponent, Marquette Golden Eagles. And here are their stats. They scored a little bit higher for points for the season, um, a little lower than um, uh, Dayton did. Now, another way we can do this is instead of doing um, a, uh, a fraction, we can do a multiplication. So I'm going to show you another way you can do this. I calculated that they scored 2,728 points Marquette Eagle, uh, Golden Eagles did. Now to find out how many were three pointers, I'm gonna multiply by the decimal equivalent of my percentage. So again, by dividing by 100, I move my decimal over two places, so I'm gonna multiply 2,728 times .319. And what that's gonna give me is the percentage of that 2,178 or 2,728 as a percentage, how many were three pointers? So let's go ahead and find this out. 2728 times 0.319 equals 870232. And again, uh, we can't have that many. We had to uh, divide this by 100 because we divided a percentage by 100. And that's going to move me over, that doesn't seem right, 8,702 points. That can't be correct. All right, so let's go back and we'll do it as our decimal here. We're gonna go 31.9 all over 100 equals x over 2728. And we do our cross multiplying, I get 100x equals 2728 times 0.319 equals I get 870232 and divide that by 100. Divide by 100, 8702. Hmm, I'm still coming up with 8,000 points as three pointers. I must have made a mistake in my calculations. I'm gonna have to go back and check out, make sure that my number of points scored is actually the right number. Craig, could you just do the 2728 times 0 .319 again, please? All right, so Donna is saying is do 2728 times 0 .319 equals, yep, I get 870,000. I think your decimal point's not showing. It's 870.232. Uh, that's why I'm thinking it was, uh, that it should have been. It should be 2728 times point, or clear, 2728 times Zero point. point. Oh, I got a 2728. Yep. All right, so I made a mistake in my mathematics here, but it's gonna come out that it's 870 points, and you can do the same thing. That the math does work. Thanks for watching. Okay. 
We, all right, we have a winner in tonight's creature teaser. Hi, who are we talking to? Hello? Hi. Who is this? Raymond Noel. All right, so did you know this, or what is the winner or the creature that we're teasing you about tonight? Can you say that Raymond again? Raymond Noel. No, can you tell us what, we were, um, what creature we were talking about? We were talking about the Jap Japanese mother cox. Very cool. The snow monkey, right? Yeah. All right. Congratulations and thanks for calling. Don't forget, every correct response goes into our homework hotline Hall of Fame. Earn enough points and you could win a tablet at the end of the season. That's all the time we have for tonight. Tomorrow on Homework Hotline, we will continue looking at the Women's March Madness. And history teacher Howard Krug will be here with a lesson on Rosie the Riveter. Sounds good. Good, good night. night. Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers, working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSET, working for communities across New York State.